26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and, his, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And then Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. May the richest blessings of the Lord be upon his word, may it be sanctified and sealed in our hearts. Let's bow for prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for this another time to come together around your word with your people. And we pray that you might meet with us, and that the Holy Spirit of the living God might take this word and open it to us, that we might see the Lord Jesus Christ in a new and a fresh way uh, that will captivate us and that will cause the love that we have for you to swell up inside of us and to be expressed to you, Father, and your Son, and the Spirit through faithfulness, through obedience, through sacrificial service. Open the heart of the man, that woman, that boy or girl who needs to know you today, and may they see Jesus as their Savior and as their Lord, and may they bow to him and trust him as their personal Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to speak this morning just from a simple subject of the birth of a king, the birth of a king. Very often when we approach the Bible, particularly the Christmas story, we bring to it our own historical perspective and we bring all of the fanfare and all of the tinsel and the glitter and all of the commercialism that's associated with Christmas as we have learned to observe it here in the Western culture. But we fail to realize that none of that accompanied the first Christmas. As a matter of fact, it was somewhat uh, uneventful as we will see uh, in coming weeks. But I think it is important for us that if God chose to set a stage for 4,000 years prior to the birth of Christ and the 4,000 years of biblically recorded history, those 4,000 years, basically, they served as the backdrop, as the introduction for God to bring into the world his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will become our Lord and our Savior. And so for the last 2,000 years of recorded biblical history, we've looked back on this monumental and significant event, the virgin birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we want to take just a couple of weeks to sort of revisit it somewhat uh, slower than what we would normally do to see if we can glean some insight and some perspective that the Holy Spirit has placed in the scripture uh, regarding uh, the birth of Christ. Now we know that at the time of Mary's uh, conception, some six months earlier, the angel uh, Gabriel had appeared unto Elizabeth, her cousin, the wife of the priests and had instructed them, uh, the priest Zacharias, that his wife in her old age, Elizabeth, would be, become a child. And that happened. And so it was sort of a, a very traumatic experience for Zachariah, who had longed for children, who had not had any children. And while he was one day ministering in the temple, uh, offering the incense, that the angel spoke to him and told him that his wife would conceive, and she did conceive. And for, until the child's birth, Zacharias was unable to speak. And so six months later, 
the Holy Spirit ties and links the conception of John the Baptist and the conception of Jesus together because their lives would be connected. Now we know as we look back that John would be the forerunner of Christ. He'd be that voice that would be crying in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. That John would be that type of Elijah, the Old Testament prophet, who with regal courage and fervor and zeal thundered the word of God. And so now we see here the significance of these two men and how their lives are linked together. So in the verses that I read in your hearing, it says that in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now the, and so Gabriel the angel, he appears unto Mary. And his first words to her was to fear not. And I think that was good words because if an angel was to appear unto me and I saw the angel and knew it was an angel, after they revived me with the swat smelling sauce, uh, then he may be able to give me some instruction. And so I don't know what form the angel Gabriel appeared unto her. Did he appear uh, in the appearance that he would appear to be a, a Jewish man or did he appear in another form? But he appeared to her and he spoke to her and he instructed her that she was not to fear, as we see there in verse 30. And he says to her that thou hast found favor Thou hast found favor with God. Favor with God is to be treasured more than wealth and riches and houses and land and expensive cars and expensive clothes. To have favor with God. To have the blessing of God upon your life. There's no price that we could place upon that. And maybe because of her virtuous life, her obedience to her parents, her respect and her submission to her parents had gained her favor with God. And I would encourage you young people today, above everything else, to seek to gain favor with God. One day your health will fail you. It's hard to believe it will fail you now because you're young, you're energetic, you don't need a lot of sleep, you can eat just about anything, it doesn't bother your stomach, you can do whatever you want to do. But one day you live long enough, you can't drink milk at night, you can't eat this and that together. I mean, you got all kind of things messed up your life. And you say, what is this all about? And while you're young, you never think about those things. You never think about it all. You rip and run up and down the steps, you fall down, you get up when you're young, you brush yourself off, and you keep on going. And now you get about 50 or so, and a couple days after that, you start walking down the steps, and your knees is cracking. You bend over and stuff starts to pop. And you wonder what you're going to get back up. Your health in time, it will fail you. And I know some of y'all, y'all look in the mirror and y'all saying mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? And the mirror responds back to you, 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 you are the fairest of them all. But live long enough. And you look in the mirror and say, who in the world is that? And it kind of happens like one day you see yourself looking one way and then you look one day and you didn't change your good looks and your fine figure and your muscular toned body. They will fail you one day. You live long enough. I don't care how much zooming you do and that's good. That's a good thing. How much, road, how much exercise, all oh, that's wonderful. You got to do as much as you can. The Apostle Paul says bodily exercise profits a little. So anything that you do that will profit your body, it is a good thing. But no matter how much we do, how much we run, how much we jog, how many calisthenics we do, how much stressing we do, as we old age, our bodies will eventually fail us. But it is the favor of God to have God's blessing upon your life, to have the good will of God upon your life. And there's no greater blessing than to have God's favor upon your life when you're a child and have the favor of God to be upon your life through your ch childhood days, adolescent days, teen years, young adult years, on until adulthood, and the middle age years to have the favor of God. And so the Bible says that Gabriel says to Mary to fear not, for you have found favor with God. And let me tell you something about favor. Favor is not fair. It's not fair. My cousin that I have not talked to in probably 25 years, one of my long lost cousins. They went out in California and they were all military guys and, 
my cousin that you met a few weeks ago, we all grew up together, and so he had given my number to another cousin of mine that was somewhat like an older brother to me. We all got disconnected. Everybody gets in a hurry to go somewhere to do nothing, and you don't reconnect with family like we should. And so we called. He called me yesterday out of the clear blue sky, and we talked for almost an hour on the phone, reminiscing about how things was back in Mount Hope, West Virginia. And it's amazing to me that we remembered some of the same things about growing up in the Mountain of Hope, as we so affectionately referred to it. And there's something he said to me, and I, I, I go back to this because this was to me, and I've showed you before, the defining moment of my life. He talked to me about my oldest brother, and everyone does. And here's what he said to me. He says, I still, 45 years later, because my oldest brother had a profound impact on his life. He didn't have an older brother. So my older brother kind of mentored him along. He said, I still ask the question, why that Ricky died 17 and we got to live? He was so much better than the rest of us, so much nicer than the rest of us. And why did we get to live? And what he said to me, he, was, he said, now that I have lived and I'm almost 60 years old, I realize at 17, all of life is really still in front of you if you're able to live long enough. And so he groped and he wrestled with that. I say, somewhere in God's plan, God understood that his life would have more of an impact on us if it ended at 17 that he lived until he was 70. But we have the opportunity to have God's favor upon our lives. And now as middle-aged men, we have a chance to impact our children, our grandchildren, and other young people that are coming behind us if we realize that we indeed have the favor of God upon our lives. Oh, I wish I could get some help this morning. As I shared with you on last week, we underestimate the power and the potency and the significance that we are Christian men and women. And that we are trustees, as I shared with you last week, we are trustees, we are the keepers of the divine, sacred secrets of God, of the revelation of God. And we take the word of God and share it with people. And we share the insight and the wisdom that God has allowed us to gain from his word. The favor that's upon our life, it can be extended to other people's lives. And we can be a blessing to others as well. She had favor with God. And I trust that you realize and recognize that you know Jesus Christ, your personal savior. If you've been twice born. If you know where you are today, if you woke up this morning, if you could think cognitive, intelligent thoughts, then you too have favor with God. And so take the favor that God has given you today and use that favor for the glory of God to impact this world, this community, in the name of Jesus Christ. She had favor with God. The third thing that I see in this text that Gabriel says to Mary, and the angel came in unto her, and said, how thou art highly favored at the Lord. You're highly favored. The Lord is with thee, and blessed art thou among women. The writer of Hebrews says that we should be content with such things as we have. Because the Lord has says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. If there's one thing that characterizes the United States of America, one thing that characterized this nation that maybe has been favored more than any nation in the history of the world except the nation of Israel. The thing that characterizes us is our ingratitude, is our inability to be grateful, is our inability to be satisfied with what things that we have. Right now in the United States Congress has moved over into the Senate. They're debating as to whether or not the tax cuts should be extended, or whether or not the tax cuts should not be extended. Who should get the tax cuts and who should not get the tax cuts? And so when you listen to the debate and you listen to the argument, at the root of it you find there is a preoccupation with just selfishness that we cannot come together and basically say, what's the best thing to do? What is going to be the best thing to do for the nation? What's going to benefit the highest number of people? How do we move things forward? Instead, we get paralyzed and political gridlock, unable to move anything together, and why our country continues to struggle to re recover and to rebound. And at the root cause of it, many of our problems in our nation is just our own selfishness, our own greed, the inability to accept less and to do with less, and to be content with such things as we have. And so 
The angel Gabriel says to Mary, she's highly favored and she is blessed. We are blessed. We really and truly are blessed. There are times that, that I actually feel, why should I be so blessed? When I look at the rest of the world, when I look at two-thirds of the rest of the world, that they live on a fraction of what I live on. They eat a fraction of what I eat. Don't you know many nations in Africa, people don't eat three times a day? Many third world country people are unable to eat three meals a day. They simply don't have those type of resources. And we eat three meals, five snacks, desserts, late night stuff, and getting up and walking and eating that night when everybody else is asleep. Amen, lights. I ain't the only one. I ain't the only one. Y'all do it too. Y'all just might as well tell it. Y'all hiding food from your husband or your wife. Y'all, y'all do it too. Y'all going in the refrigerator and getting the stuff out of here about if Dustin went to sleep. It's a blessing to be able to open the refrigerator and have something in it except a cup of water. We are blessed. We are blessed. And during this time of the year, we are, should remind ourselves of how blessed we are. Look at the problem that most of us are dealing with. Most of us have the problem of trying to figure out what we want for Christmas. Ain't that something? If it takes you over two minutes to decide what you want for Christmas, you don't need nothing. You don't need anything. If it takes you more than two minutes, if you don't have something that you really need so bad that it takes you more than two minutes to figure out what it is you need, what it really means you don't need nothing. And if it takes you over five minutes to figure out what to buy somebody else, they don't need nothing. I tell people now, don't, don't give me no gift cards. Give me the cash. <laughs> give me the, be tacky with me if you want to be tacky. They say it's tacky. Just be as tacky as you want to be because I might lose that card, but I'm not going to lose no M-O-N-E-Y, okay? I, I, a card hadn't read it yet that it is legal tender. But they even rip you off with those cards. Don't you know if you buy a gift card from the town center mall, 365 days after you buy it, it starts to decrease in value. And so every month that you don't use it, they deduct, you, you ain't did nothing with it held on to it. They deduct from, I think, 2% of whatever it is. You go up there with a $50 gift certificate held on to it for two years, it might be worth 40 Give me the tacky cash. I guarantee you I won't lose it. And when I spend it, I remember you. <laughs> we are blessed people. We're blessed to be able to, to be able to give, to be able to help somebody. That's a blessing to be able to help somebody. And so the angel Gabriel says to Mary, she's highly favored and she's blessed. And so we join in with Mary today. We've been highly favored by God and we have been blessed by God as well. He goes on to say to her, and when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. Now note what the angel Gabriel said. He said to her that she's blessed among women. That she's blessed among women. And remember when I said that favor is not fair. God can choose to bless someone above how he blesses someone else. God can choose to give someone a gift that he doesn't give to someone else. God can choose to give someone skill or someone an ability, and he doesn't give it to someone else. That's God's divine prerogative. God is not obligated to treat all of us the same. The favor of God is not fair. It is God's favor. It is God who causes us to be different from each other. And God knows what he can entrust each and every one of us with. Even the best of parents, the most diligent parent, the most knowledgeable parent, of the children are still limited in their perception. So there are times we give things to our children that we shouldn't give them. And sometimes in our ability to treat them the same, we hurt them because they don't have the same level of maturity. And they're not all the same uh, level of responsibility. So one of your child, children, you might be able to let them drive when they turn 16. The other one is so irresponsible the other one is, 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 is so uh, um, uh, immature that they might not be able to drive your car until they're 35, if you follow what I'm saying, unless you want your insurance to be $3 million a year. My point by exaggeration and hyperbole is that God, unlike us as parents, we are finite in our understanding. God is omniscient. So God knows each and every one of us. 
He knows us intimately. And so God knows that if he gives some of us too much, we're going to hurt ourselves with it. He gives some too much, we're going to hurt somebody else with it. He gives some of us too much, then we're going to become irresponsible and we're going to become less dependent upon him. So some of us, God can only give us exactly what we need to get by because if he gives us more than what we need to get by, we're going to forget all about him. But as long as he gives us just enough to get by, we're going to be in prayer meeting, Bible study, Sunday school, church, witnessing, praying, fasting, because we call it on the Lord because the light man wants his money and the water gas man wants his money and the mortgage company wants their money. And all we know to do is to call on the name of the Lord. Help me, somebody. But we're favored and we're blessed. And we must always count our blessings and recognize the good hand of God upon our lives. And during this season in particular, not allow ourselves to become envious of people who have much more than what we have. Now, most poor people say what I'm getting ready to say. Most poor people say, I don't want to be rich. And the reason they say it because they're not rich. <laughs> so it's easy to say, I don't want to be rich when I ain't got no money. But personally, I've never had any desire to be rich. And I ain't got no money either. <laughs> When I look at the responsibility, the burden that it has, I look at the responsibility when people think you got some money. You see what I'm saying? If they think you got a dollar. So because, you know, I pastor the Grace Bible Church and you guys buying this big, beautiful building on the Kanawha River and people just think that, well, you, you got to have some money. They think Grace Bible Church has some money. The government sends people to this church to get help. The government. So wait a minute, the government sent you here. Why did they send you here? They got all the money, they got the taxes, they got the stimulus, they got the rebate. Why they send you here? So people think you got a dollar, they'll hound you down, they'll look you up, they'll try to find you. I said, what would it be like if we had one or two or three dollars? It would be just terrible if you really had it. So I don't want that type of burden or responsibility, Amen. Hey, boy, you can give it. I just put it in a blind trust so people won't know I got it. <laughs> My point is that there is a responsibility that comes along with having resources. A responsibility to be a good steward toward God and to be wise in how you use those resources. And sometimes the worst thing you can do for some people is give them a dollar. If you want to fall out with somebody, give them money. Some people, because they will find a reason to fall out with you because they don't want to pay you back. <laughs> Instead of just saying, look, can we be friends, but I ain't going to pay you back. Instead of just being truthful about it, they'll find out a reason to fall out with you because they don't want to be responsible to pay you back. What I'm saying is God understands what we can handle and what we can't handle how much responsibility we can deal with and what we can't deal with. And so God meets out resources to us based on his knowledge of our ability to manage what he gives us. And so what God is saying to Mary, Mary, you don't fear. You are highly favored. You've been blessed. You've been chosen among women by God to carry God's child, to bring the Savior into the world. Now, having said that, that is a message to every mother and also to every father as well. That the greatest gift that God entrusts to us as human beings is another human being. The greatest gift that God gives to women, that's why Paul in his writing to Timothy says that women are always elevated from second-class citizenship. It doesn't matter what men say, you can't relegate women to second-class citizenship when they are the bearers of the children when they make sure that the society is perpetuated, that every man owes its existence to some woman that bore him, that carried him for nine months, so there's no way women can be second, relegated to second-class citizenship. That's what Paul says. And so that great gift that God gives to us, to women as mothers, to men as fathers, and we were talking about that on Wednesday night, when you look at what is happening in our society today, at, at the fundamental root, cause of the disintegration of our society today in its parents abdicating their responsibility to be the very best parents that they can possibly be. There's no greater contribution that we can make 
to the church, to the society, to the nation, than to do the best we can by our children. And so when God chooses to entrust another human being with the life of another human being, God has shown a tremendous commitment and a, a, a tremendous appreciation for that you're going to do the right thing. And so that's what God was saying to Mary. You are blessed. The angel was saying to Mary, you are blessed. You are highly favored. God has selected you. Of all the women he could have selected, God has selected you to bring into the world the Savior of the world. Now, I talk about our responsibility to children all the time because we never know what God is entrusting to us. And just as God, the Holy Spirit, entrusted Mary to carry the baby Jesus, God entrusts the church with children from the neighborhood and the community. We don't know what we're carrying around inside of us, inside the church. We don't know the potential that the children of the Grace Bible Church has. The children that found their way here. You know, most adults don't get on the bus to ride to church. But children are getting on the van. They don't have to get on it. They're choosing to get on the van to come to the church because they found something here they feel like they need. And who can tell what God might be entrusting to us? Maybe God is saying to the Grace Bible Church that we are blessed and that we are highly favored and that God is choosing to entrust to us maybe a child that will come to faith in Jesus Christ, that will commit their lives to Christ from an early age, that will experience God's favor upon their lives, and that God will use them as you would to bring salvation through the preaching of the gospel, the sharing of the gospel to their family, to their friends, to the neighborhood, so much so that may turn around the whole society. We never under Never underestimate what God might be doing. What might appear to be an ordinary day, God may decide to show up and entrust you with an extraordinary gift and responsibility. And God might choose to use you to set in motion a spiritual chain reaction that would bring, bright, bring about a revival to where many people might be saved. Mary had no idea of the ramifications of this angelic visitation, nor of the angelic proclamation. But let me close right here for this morning. Verse 30, and the angel said unto her, Fear not, mirth, for thou hast found favor with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now we know there's a specific application here which speaks of the fact that the Holy Spirit would overshadow Mary and she would conceive and the child that she would conceive would be the Christ child. But I think there is an application here from the standpoint that when God the Holy Spirit overshadows us, when God the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside of us, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, when the sovereign omnipotent God chooses to take up residence inside of us, he does it so that he can bring forth something, so that he can give birth to something. Some of you are pregnant with God inside of you, and God wants to birth something. God wants to bring something forth. God wants to bring something into the world. He wants to bring and manifest something that hasn't been done before, that hasn't been seen before. But just as childbirth is a painful process, so I have been told. And as I have witnessed, the bringing forth of what God has to bring forth out of us will be a painful process. And sometimes we shirk away from the pain of living the Christian life, the travail of living the Christian life. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Galatians, he says that I labor with birth pains until Christ is formed inside of you. 
And some of you mothers know what I'm talking about who have gone through the pain of childbirth. But you go through the pain of childbirth again, longing for to see your children walking with God and doing the right thing and growing spiritually and maturing. So as if you go through another childbirth to see Christ formed inside of them. And so God is saying to all of us, are we willing to labor like a woman will labor in birth to bring forth life into the world? Are we willing to submit ourselves to God and allow God to work in and through us and to use us to the point of physical, spiritual exhaustion so that God might bring forth that which will bring glory to him? Paul writes in Romans chapter 12 that we should present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. And someone has said the problem with a living sacrifice that it keeps on crawling off the altar. <laughs> and that's our problem. We want to see God do something. We want to see our husband say. We want to see our wife say. We want to see our children say. We want to see members of our family say, we want to see change coming about. But are we willing to be the sacrifice? Are we willing to labor until God can bring it to bear in and through us? That becomes a question. That becomes a question. But the potential is so great, as the angel said to Mary, he said that of his kingdom there shall be no end. There shall be no end. And I've been reading with great interest. Um, all of the uh, controversy surrounding the football game. Should they get to play or should they not get to play? So I guess the courts got the rule here in a few days to determine whether or not they get to play. And my whole point is this, sports is a wonderful expression of camaraderie and competition and I encourage kids to participate in sports because sports can teach you a lot about yourself, how to work with people, how to accomplish a goal, how to learn how to lose and not be mad and angry, how to learn how to win and not become too arrogant. A lot of wonderful things that you can learn from sports. But our preoccupation with it is amazing. And I'm saying that we're, we're caught up into this thing. We got two judges now. One in the southern part of the state in Kanawha County, and one up in the, the northern part of the state, I think in Brooker, Hancock County, and now they got the dueling judges, filed an injunction to keep things, and then they're going to go to the state Supreme Court to rule whether or not they can play a football game. A football game. That has no eternal significance, no eternal consequence, will not make that much a difference in the whole scheme of things. But it's our Preoccupation with something is not really that important. And at the same time, young people are getting caught up in drugs and crime and violence and all types of deviant behavior, and we're talking about a football game. We're talking about a football game. We're majoring in the minors. We're minoring in the majors, but the role of the church has to always be to major in the majors and understand that the souls of people always are weighing in the balance day in and day out, week in and week out. And so we're trying to make ourselves available to the Lord, to be used by him to bring in a harvest of souls into his kingdom. And I believe that God wants to do that. And I'm not discouraged. People can major and minor things they want to. But we're going to keep our focus on what can we do to tell people about Jesus? What can we do to show people the love of Christ? What can we do to help people see authentic Christian lives being lived by people just like them who just try to live for God when people are looking and when people aren't looking, who are just trying to be God's people to give other people hope the salvation can come to them also. We're blessed. We're highly favored. God has overshadowed us. God wants to bring something forth in and through us. And the question is, will we submit ourselves and surrender ourselves as Mary did to allow the Lord to have complete control of us even when we don't understand what he's doing? If we're willing to do that, God will bring forth something 
that will have an eternal consequence and significance. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we, we know intellectually that we have been blessed. We know it. We know that we are, we are highly favored. We, we can look at the rest of the world. We can look at many people that live in and close to us. And we can see that it's not because of we, we've lived so well, we've lived so intelligently, we've lived so spiritual. 